Hi everyone, uh, it's lovely to, well I was going to say it's lovely to see you, I can't see you, but I can feel you in the room, so there you go. I'm just going to share my screen, and uh, there we go. So I hope that you can all see that well, yes? Yeah? Jolly good. Okay, so I'm going to be letting you uh, into my world of uh, giant lasers, basically. Um, I'm not going to make a secret of it, I'm a big fan of lasers. They're pretty incredible. Um, they've existed since 1960, but when they started to exist, it wasn't really clear what they would be used for. They were basically a solution looking for a problem. Um, but since then, you know, they've, they've been useful for a whole host of things from, you know, information, transport, industry, medicine, um, entertainment. Yeah, you have on average three lasers in your home with your various CD players and things like that as well. So, so they're pretty ubiquitous and they're pretty important for, for life in general, really, uh, and our entertainment. So um, there's much to tell about the invention of lasers, but this isn't the story of how lasers are invented, because I know why you're all here. You all want to hear about how great big ginormous lasers uh, work and what sort of physics we can unlock with these ginormous lasers. So, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Just before I scan on, um, this picture is an extraordinarily beautiful picture that was taken uh, on one of my experiments uh, a number of years ago now, 2015. Um, and it is a picture of one of the world's most intense laser plasma interactions. And now that's not going to make any sense to you whatsoever, but hopefully by the end of this talk, it will. What we're seeing here is, in fact, the laser's coming in and hitting a piece of material. The green stuff you can see isn't the actual laser. The laser's infrared, so you can't see it. Um, what you can see is kind of re-emission um, of, a, of a separate harmonic, let's say, of the laser light, which is in green. And you can see all of the sort of target and, um, and diagnostics all around it, looking at what's going on in this kind of mystical uh, realm inside, uh, well, what I'm going to tell you about, which is um, plasma, which is made by lasers. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm going to tell you about how we make these giant lasers in the first place and then what we might use them for. So on that, without further ado, I'm going to uh, tell you all about uh, what's going on. So I want to uh, I want you to think, what do you imagine uh, when you think of lasers then? Uh, perhaps you think of the Death Star from Star Wars vaporizing a planet, perhaps. Or perhaps you think of a little minion vaporizing another minion with a giant comic comical laser that makes odd noises, you know, in a cartoon. Or perhaps you think of something slightly more real but slightly more scary, uh, laser weapons on the front of submarines and things like that. Or maybe you think of something a bit more close to home, like the supermarket and uh, the scanning of, uh, of, of veggies over the scanner. Either way... Um, some of these lasers are true applications, some of them aren't. Clearly, we don't have a Death Star at the moment, which is uh, a good thing, frankly, as far as I'm concerned. So, so um, basically, lasers are all over the shop, uh, including shops. And um, we're going to think about how those lasers come to be um, and what we can use them for, basically. So before we consider how a laser works, we need to wind it back a little bit and consider what on earth is light. So light is an electromagnetic wave, okay? So what does that mean? Well, that means we've got a kind of magnetic wave at a, a, a magnetic component at right angles to an electric component, and that's all oscillating. And light can be anything from radio waves which are kilometers in wavelength and what do we mean by wavelength well we mean the spacing of the waves right so kilometer that's sort of you know useful for radio broadcasts and things like that through to microwaves which are kind of centimeters or millimeters in length to to infrared 
which is emitted by things that are hot. Uh, well, in sort of, um, well, it depends how hot they are, of course. Um, then visible light, which is indeed the stuff that we can actually see. And then we go all the way to the other end, the shorter end, you know, ultraviolet or X-rays or gamma rays, which are actually their wavelengths are kind of on the atomic size or the nuclear side. So we don't, light isn't just visible light. It's everything from radio waves all the way through to gamma rays. Um, it's all the same thing, just different wavelengths, okay? Um, and light itself is really, really interesting, the light that we can see, okay? So um, white light is sort of pouring down, down on me at the moment. Now, what, what is white light? Well, if I just show you this CD here, we don't see these very much anymore, really, what with streaming services and everything else, but you can see rainbow, right? And what this CD is actually doing is splitting the white light up into its constituent colours. Because white light is actually just made up of loads of colours, right? All of the colours that we can see from red through to violet. Um, and so it's really interesting to think about um, the fact that the white light that we see is actually a mix of just a bunch of colours uh, all combined together. Um, and allows us to see stuff. I often wish I could see in the infrared, actually, because at my lasers that I use are infrared, and it would make it a lot easier than have to look to see where it is through some viewer in the dark with goggles and all of my bunny suits on and everything. It would make life a lot easier, I can assure you with that. So light is ubiquitous. It allows us to see in the universe and uh, can be anything from radio waves all the way through to gamma rays. So... What is a laser then, and how does it work? Well, suppose we have a collection of atoms just hanging around doing their thing. Atoms can actually become excited. They can absorb energy and enter what we call an excited state. So it's sort of like when you drink an energy drink, you know, like Red Bull or something, and then you're like, oh, I've got so much energy. Oh, and what we do to lose the energy is uh, run around and, you know, flap about. But atoms can actually lose that energy by emitting chunks of light called photons. All right. So you can have uh, you can actually excite atoms with chunks of light as well called photons. So suppose we had a photon come in, excite an atom. Um, then. You could also have, um, you could also um, excite all of those uh, atoms with some light, okay? And they're all sitting there excited. Now, another photon comes in and interacts with these already excited atoms that have absorbed some energy, typically through chunks of light called photons. And what that causes these atoms to do is de-excite and so emit light. But in this case, the light is identical to the light that came in. So this photon here came into a bunch of already excited atoms, caused one of those excited atoms to de-excite, i.e. run around. And, and the way it does that is emitting uh, photons. But the special thing here is that that photon that it's emitted is identical to the photon that came in. So it's like a photon photocopier. So you can imagine doing this over and over again. Now, this is just one pass, okay? What happens if you surrounded those atoms with some mirrors? Those photons can then start bouncing back and forth through all of the excited atoms, causing more and more light to be emitted. Now, this process is called stimulated emission. And that's actually part of the acronym of laser, light amplification through stimulated emission radiation. So that's laser. So now you'll know that laser isn't spelt with a Z. I get very angry when people spell laser with a Z because it's not stimulated emission, it's stimulated emission. And that's exactly this process that I've described here. Now, what I've just constructed in front of you is what we laser people call a laser cavity, where laser light is bouncing backwards and forwards between two mirrors. But you might be thinking to yourself, well, Kate, that's really stupid because how does the light get out? And that's a very, very, very good question. Um, one of these mirrors is partially reflective, so it does let some of the light out. 
So that's the way a very basic laser works, okay? Now, we need to consider why is laser light special compared to just the light that's raining down on me right now from the strip lights in this room? So let's consider that. Let's understand what makes lasers special. So the first thing is something that we call coherence, right? So what we can think about here is that the light that's coming down on me now clearly is visible light, which I said before was kind of a rainbow of colors. Of, and so they'll have different wavelengths and they're all spread out all over the place. Laser light, all the waves line up with each other. So they're all in step. And actually what that is, is additive. So it means that all those waves add up. So it's very powerful and, and going in one direction. So it's kind of like thinking like, you know, when you're in the audience of, of, a, of a show, you've been at a theatre or something or a gig and your band's finished and everyone's clapping and, you know, it's all just kind of white noise, clap, clap, clap. What happens if someone counted you in and you all started clapping at the same time? Your claps would add and they would be loud and together compared to when you were all just clapping at your own pace. And that's what this is kind of like, right? All these waves in step and adding up together. So that's what we mean by coherence, okay? Now, this is a graph, I apologize. Uh, it's a Thursday evening, but still, this is science talk. So there are graphs, right? So laser light is really, really special because it is what we call monochromatic, i.e. one color. So if you look at this graph here, you've got, Wavelength along the bottom here um, in nanometers, so that's 10 to the minus 9 of a meter, um, a nanometer, and then some arbitrary intensity along the side. So this broad curve here is the sort of spectrum you would get from a, an incandescent light bulb. It probably would actually extend more into the infrared as well because it's hot. The filament is hot, so it will be emitting in the infrared as well. But the, the bit you can see is very, very broad. Um, sort of a bit like this uh, torch here, um, very, very broad band white light, okay? Um, but I have a little friendly laser here, right? You can see it's a green laser. So what I've done here is I've popped the spectrum of that green laser here, and it's very, very narrow spectrum all around green. So 532 na nanometers, this laser wavelength is. And so you can see it's a very singular color. And that's very, very useful for a number of different applications, especially, um, especially in science when we're trying to excite particular things. And that's why lasers are really useful um, because there are specific wavelengths which, are, um, which can be very, very useful for, for research among other things and practical applications. So that's another reason why laser light is really, really special. Laser light is really directional, right? You know, this sort of uh, is why people can shine lasers for a long distance. It's why they can be very dangerous, especially if they're not eye safe, that you can shine them. They're very, very narrow beam, narrow, narrow pencil beam with narrow divergence, so they don't spread out very much, which is why people can get into trouble when they're shining two powerful laser beams into, you know, the cockpits of planes and things like that, you know, um, yeah, I don't recommend you do that. It's a very silly thing to do, but that's because of this amazing uh, property of laser light that, you know, I can shine this behind me. You can see it on the wall behind me. It's a very, very small laser spot. You can see it on my hand as I pull it away. It doesn't get any bigger, right? Oh, trying to line that up on my hand. Perhaps if I looked at it, there you go. You can see it doesn't diverge, right? That is a very, very unique property of lasers, which means they're, they can travel very long distances in a very, very narrow divergence, but also it means they're very manipulable so that you can reflect them off um, mirrors and take them into different directions and so forth. So it's an extremely powerful property for us uh, of lasers. And finally, uh, laser beams are eminently focus focusable, basically. You can pass them through lenses or off reflective parabolic mirrors um, and they can become very powerful because power, uh, power is energy over time, right? Okay, so 
then intensity, which is the thing that's really important here, is power divided by the area. So if we take quite a big spot and we focus it down to a very, very small spot, what we get are incredibly high intensities. And that, that fact actually underpins everything that I'm going to be talking about from now on uh, in this talk. Um, very, very exciting property. The, the, the sort of lasers I use, um, they, we basically, they're so powerful, they have to be transported at a beam that's about 60 centimeters in diameter. And they're so powerful, they can't just be passed through lenses because it would actually damage those optics. So they have to be reflected off big parabolic mirrors, uh, sort of like the, the mirrors at the back of Hubble telescope and things like that. And so we take this beam that's 60 centimeters and we focus it down to five microns, which is basically about a tenth of a human hair. And so the intensity of the beam is incredible, like unprecedented intensity. So um, this means that laser light, you know, depending on the power of the beam and how much you focus it, you can do anything from popping lasers to cutting metal to indeed even ripping apart atoms, which is what we do with them uh, here at the University of York. So uh, very, very exciting stuff. So that those four things mean that lasers are incredibly useful in many, many different fields and applications. But the thing I'm going to tell you about is what we do with them. What we do with the most powerful, most high intensity lasers on the planet. Well, it might be even in the universe, but I don't know what other, if there are other alien species and they've done better lasers than we have, who knows? But all I know about is the lasers we have on Earth. So as far as I know, they're the best in the universe uh, until other evidence says otherwise. <laughs> so let's think about what happens when you fire literally the world's most intense laser at a piece of material, because that's what I do. Okay. So what we're looking at here is a, a beautiful picture, again, taken on an experiment that we did in 2017. So this is a top-down view of um, an experiment. So the laser's coming in from this side. And again, it's not the green beam. The laser beam is infrared. So this is what we call the Vulcan petawatt laser. So petawatt is 10 to the 15 watts. So that is... 10 to the 18 times more powerful than this little laser beam. This is a milliwatt. So a milliwatt is eye safe. So if you're buying lasers off the internet that are more than a milliwatt, beware. That's all I'm going to say. All I'm going to say. Um, but yes, so the lasers that, uh, that we have are petawatts, so 10 to the 15 watts. So definitely don't want to get your eyes in the way of that. Yeah, super, super powerful. Um, so the laser beam's coming in here, and then you can see we're creating... Um, basically the laser beam is so intense, the electric field of that laser beam is so high that we can rip apart uh, the atom as it, as it is, right? So if you think about what the atom is, it's a nucleus with electrons kind of swimming around the outside. Those electrons start to gain energy and they can part company with the atom. And that process is called ionization. And so what you end up with is something called plasma. And I'm going to tell you a bit more about that in a bit. But what that also means is we've got lots of free electrons swimming around. All right. And those free electrons are basically driven in. It's a massive current. So we're talking a million amps, a million amps. The, you know, lightning, for example, we've got a beautiful picture of this here. Lightning is, you know, about maybe sort of, 30,000 to 100,000 amps. Um, whereas, you know, we're, we're driving a million amps into this target and, you know, your plug socket is 13 amps, right? So, so these are at the most extreme conditions. Like we're driving mega amp currents into very, very tiny volumes, um, less than a millimeter, right? And so we're getting temperatures that are the sort of approaching the center of the sun. So, you know, 10 or 15 million degrees Kelvin or centigrade, however you want to, however you want to think about it. And so that's absolutely incredible. These are really, really extreme conditions. And so what we can see here is we've created this really extreme states of matter. And 
the camera that we've used to take this is just a standard SLR, really. Um, so one of your normal cameras, but it has a whacking great lens on the front. Um, we uh, very delicately dubbed it, dubbed it Pervcam because it looks like one of those cameras that horrible paparazzo try and take pictures in their bikinis from a long way away. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was sitting on top of the target chamber. So this is very, very zoomed in. So this sort of distance is maybe five centimetres, something like that, across, five centimetres across uh, in this picture. Um, the whole target chamber itself is, it has to be kept under vacuum because when you fire the lasers, the lasers would just turn the air into plasma, which is not what we want to happen. We want, uh, we want whatever is nestling behind all this light to be uh, turned into plasma. And not only are we creating, so we're driving these huge mega amp currents, we're also creating enormous magnetic fields, giga gauss, so billion gauss. And just to put it into perspective, one of these fridge magnets is about 50 gauss. So it's about 20 million times the strength of a, of a little fridge magnet. So these are kind of the sort of magnetic fields you get in neutron star atmospheres. It's very extreme conditions. And so we end up creating very extreme conditions, very high temperatures, very interesting atomic states. We create lots of we accelerate lots of particles. So we've got electrons, we've got protons, we've got neutrons being produced all sorts of stuff, and it makes it incredibly interesting to study, okay? So we're creating some of the most extreme conditions on Earth here in a very, very tiny space. So what does a high-power laser actually look like? So this is uh, a picture of, well, I'd say the laser I grew up on. It was a laser that I, I used to work at this laser, the Vulcan uh, laser at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxfordshire for about 10 and a half years before coming to, to York, which is almost 10 years ago now as well. And I'm still a very big user of these, of these facilities. So this whole thing here is about the size of two Olympic swimming pools. This is a laser, right? So it's not a thing like this. What a laser is, what a high power laser is, is essentially a room like a collection of rooms filled with laser amplifiers, okay? So what is a laser amplifier? Well, behind me, I've got a chunk of the Vulcan laser. This, this here is a laser amplifier. Obviously, all laser amplifiers don't have my face behind it. This was presented to me uh, as a present when I left uh, the Rutherford Lab to come here at York. So it's a real privilege to have a laser amplifier. I only hope they don't ask for it back because <laughs> this, this laser glass is, is rare. So what Vulcan is, is, is what we call a glass laser. Um, now, it's glass, but it's doped with a particular element called neodymium. Now, um, you can get most things to laze. So not all lasers are like this. You, you can get solids, liquids, gases to laze. In fact, I had a colleague at the central laser facility that tried to get strawberry jelly to laze once, which was quite funny. He didn't succeed, needless to say, but did get light emitted out of it, but it wasn't laser light. It wasn't here. Um, so what this is, is a, a piece of glass and it's doped with an element called neodymium. And the neodymium is the thing that um, is the atoms that you need to get excited. So if you remember, I said before, we need to get a load of atoms excited somehow with Generally, we use photons to excite them. And then you pass seed photon in to have this photo, photon photocopier action. So the reason why we have so many big rooms filled with all these laser amplifiers. So this, is into, this amplifier that I just showed you is integrated into these things here, which are the full laser amplifiers. And so most of sort of this here is just filled with these laser amplifiers. And then at the front here are um, facilities where the laser comes through the hole in the wall and is actually fired at a thing. So my realm is in this back bit here, which is where what we call the target areas are. So the lasers come in and they get they get passed into the chamber and then get fired under vacuum. Uh, and indeed, there's a picture of me looking uh, extremely involved in, in setting up an experiment. Um, 
uh, in one of these target chambers. So you have to dress up like that because obviously hair and skin and things can coat uh, the optics. And also you breathing on the optics can coat them. And it, it's really important to keep them clean so that your interactions are, and so you don't, well, personally don't damage the optics, but also um, so you have really um, clean interactions. Um, so these are huge facilities. So if I was telling you before, the laser beam that we use here, so this one right, this one right at the end, uh, this uh, laser facility here, um, this is the petawatt area where the petawatt beam comes in. So that's the one that's 10 to the 15 watts. Um, that beam is so powerful, we have to keep it very big when we're transporting it. And we can only focus it at the very, very last minute. And so we have to transport it with, with mirrors that are meter scale. And also it's worth saying that these are not continuous wave lasers, right? If you think power is energy over time, so we're putting maybe a few hundred joules, but we're, we're firing it in a picosecond. So that's 10 to the minus 12 of a second. So that's what makes the power really high. And so what actually you've got when, when the beam comes into the area is just a big pancake of light that's finite in time and so therefore in space coming into the area. So it's not a continuous pencil beam like this, but a pancake of light at 60 centimeters, which at the very last moment we focus down to that fraction of a human hair. So it's kind of like taking all the, the light that's falling from the sun on the earth and focusing it on the head of a pin. It's incredibly intense. So it produces intensities of approximately 10 to the 21 watts per square centimeter. So these are some of the most extreme conditions that you can create on earth. Now, um, this facility will be swiftly overtaken. There are lasers that are just about to come online, which are an order of magnitude even more powerful than this. And I'm very excited to see what we can do with those lasers, I can assure you. And that brings me on to the topic of what on earth do you do with these lasers? Well, there we go. That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Or rather more multiple million dollar question. So um, we can create weird atomic states that don't normally occur in nature and allow us to study and probe atoms and, and what they get up to. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, we can miniaturize particle accelerators because the reason conventional accelerators are so big is because they can't wind up the power of the magnets too much because they end up creating this stuff called plasma, which I'm going to tell you about, which is what they want to avoid. But we actually thrive on that and we can actually accelerate particles in that plasma. And so we can actually miniaturize things like we could eventually miniaturize CERN from like 22 kilometers around, you know, the Large Hadron Collider um, between Switzerland and France. We could miniaturize that to maybe a few meters eventually. Uh, we can't do that yet, but we know pretty well how we might do it. So that's very exciting. And because we're sort of piling loads of energy into a very, very small volume, we can start studying conditions relevant to astrophysical conditions. So we do what, what is called laboratory astrophysics. So we can study things like astrophysical jets. So that's what this picture over here looks like. Um, and we can also even um, try and answer questions like, what is the origin of the mag magnetic field in the universe and things like that um, with these tiny baby astrophysical experiments. So rather than sending something up to figure out, we can actually recreate these things in miniature on Earth, which is absolutely fantastic. And what I'm actually going to be talking about for the rest of this talk is energy generation, trying to use lasers to help us realize clean carbon free energy. And that's a really big ask. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time telling you about how scientists that are using high power lasers might go about doing that. So before we do that, I've got a little bit of bad news, unfortunately. So um, what we've got here is a plot of year along the bottom and then something called billion of barrels of oil equivalent, which is effectively just energy consumption. Now, what this plot assumes is that the world population will stabilize uh, at around 10 billion folks in the world. Um, and so this top curve here is the energy consumption, assuming that that's true. And what this bottom curve here is the energy available that we have from conventional means, right? So what you can see is there's a rather large shortfall occurring here. So sort of people living 
uh, in the next century are going to be, well, a little bit screwed, to be quite honest. Uh, but don't panic, right? Because scientists like myself, obviously not me alone, this is a big endeavour, are trying to solve the problem uh, using giant lasers. So if we look out into our own dear universe, we can look at the sun, all right? I don't, I don't uh, advocate looking directly at the sun. That's a very silly thing to do. But um, the sun is a big nuclear reactor in the sky, essentially. Um, what's happening deep within the center of the stars, and sun, like our sun, is that it's taking some light uh, atoms, fusing them together, and producing energy in a process that's called nuclear fusion. And... Indeed, all the atoms that make up our bodies were forged in this way, pretty much, in the centre of stars like our sun. And then somehow ended up in this vicinity of our universe and condensed out into planets and things and people and then turned into lasers and pens and whatnot. So without this process of nuclear fusion, we simply wouldn't exist and what it also means is that we're all made of bits of star. We're all made of stardust. We are a direct result of nuclear fusion. And also the, the light and heat from nuclear fusion sustains life on Earth. And it always has done as long as life has existed. So nuclear fusion is a really, really important uh, energy source for us as a humankind and everything else that lives on the planet. But, you know, that's pretty complicated, right? So, so we are good at capturing uh, the energy from the sun. We can do that through solar and whatever else. But wouldn't it be rather exquisite if we actually could just make our own miniature star and turn it off and on when we wanted? And that's kind of the aim of, of this research, okay? So how do we go about doing that? Well, we're trying to recreate what's happening uh, on Earth. Like, sorry, what's happening in, on, in stars on Earth. So they're basically converting hydrogen into helium and, and we want to do the same thing really so we take two types of hydrogen tritium and deuterium and deuterium is present in seawater in very large amounts so for every six thousand hydrogens there's a deuterium so for very very huge supply of deuterium tritium however is a little bit of a problem in that it uh, well it's radioactive and it decays so it's got a 12 year half-life so it doesn't stick around for very long so for every uh, 10 to the 17 hydrogens, there's only one tritium. So it's not really naturally occurring. So you might think, well, you guys are idiots basing energy source on that. But we are going to make tritium. So I will tell you about that in a minute. So we take these deuteriums of tritiums and we have to give them lots of energy um, and they will fuse together. And then eventually what they create is helium. Well, helium nucleus, which is an alpha particle, and a neutron. And that neutron carries away most of the kinetic energy of the, of the interaction. So where does this energy come from? Well, we've all seen this world's most famous equation, E equals mc squared. Um, so what does this mean? Well, this is energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. And Einstein said that the speed of light uh, was constant in all reference frames. Um, so... What we care about here is that C, the speed of light, is a constant. And actually, C is a big number, so C squared is a very, very big number. But what that means is that energy and mass have this intimate relationship with each other. So what that means for us is if we took um, the masses of deuterium and tritium and added them together, did the thing and got our resultant products and then added those masses together, we'd find that there was a mass loss between the first and second situation. And if we take that little value, that delta M, and times it by C squared, we get a huge amount of energy. So that's where the energy comes from. We've unlocked it by fusing these particles together, all right, through E equals MC squared. So it's a really fantastic uh, 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 method of getting energy. It's very, very efficient. Um, let's think about the tritium problem. So I said tritium wasn't naturally occurring. So we need to use the neutron. So the neutron um, can be captured by, if we surround the reactor with lithium, it can get captured by the lithium and it can make tritium through nuclear reactions. So hopefully we should be able to make uh, tri uh, tritium in enough quantities to, to sustain our uh, fusion needs. So what we have on the bottom here 
is this is 40 tons of coal and the same amount of energy is released from burning that as the fusion energy you'd get from half a bar full of seawater. So the deuterium in that and the lithium in the laptop battery. So it's an incredibly efficient energy generation source. And that half a bar full of seawater and the lithium in a laptop battery is one of your lifetime's energy needs sorted through fusion. So it's a very, very attractive energy source. And of course, it also, you know, doesn't produce carbon and things like that and doesn't produce long lived radioactive waste. So it's a really, really attractive energy source. So one of the things that happens when you're dealing with um, matter at these kind of extreme uh, conditions is that it turns into this thing called plasma, which I've been talking about quite a lot. So if you add energy, you go from solids to liquids to gases, right? And eventually the electrons that are kind of hanging around the nucleus can part company. And what you end up with is a supercharged particles called plasma. And um, this plasma is something that we have to deal with. And these plasmas are in fusion are, well, 10 times hotter than the sun. So 150 million degrees Kelvin. And we somehow need to keep that plasma together so that fusion happens without it expanding. And we also need to keep it together without touching it. So it's really, really difficult. So we are trying to use lasers to do that job. And that is a process called inertial confinement fusion, right? So what we're going to do is we'll take a bunch of lasers and basically compress the hell out of a tiny little ball bearing sized pellet of deuterium and tritium until it kind of self-ignites, basically. Um, so it's kind of like a diesel engine in a way. Um, and there are two main ways of doing it. You either shoot the lasers into a little gold can, which then gets hot, and then the X-rays that are produced compress the fuel, or you fire the lasers directly onto the fuel. Either way, um, it's a really, really exciting uh, method to get energy. And we're using the fuel zone inertia to confine itself. And because it only happens for a very short period of time, we have to do it over and over again. So how does it work? Well, the lasers are fired on the outside of a, of a piece of, of this little capsule. The outside heats up very rapidly in a process called ablation, forcing the rest of the fuel inwards in what we call an implosion. And that's effectively Newton's third law. So every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So it's like a rocket, basically the fuel coming out the back of a rocket forces the rocket in the other direction. It's just that the rocket here is the rest of the capsule squishing in on itself. And then, you know, eventually all of this action will um, create heat in the middle, which raises the fuel to fusion temperatures. Um, we have to have exquisitely engineered little targets. They're tiny, uh, tiny little ball bearing sized targets, which uh, take months to make uh, and basically a few tens of nanoseconds to vaporize. So these target makers must be extremely patient and okay with the fact that people like me on the other end just zap these exquisitely made targets uh, in a few tens of nanoseconds, which is, you know, kind of depressing for them, I guess. But anyway, hopefully they're fulfilling their lives by making these beautiful targets for us. Just a few numbers. Um, so in order to get net energy, which is what we call ignition, um, you need to put a few megajoules in. So what's a megajoule? Well, that's about the energy contained in a four bar Kit Kat. <laughs> and so, but I, uh, that doesn't sound like much, but I suspect you've not tried to eat a four bar Kit Kat in a, in a nanosecond. Uh, you've given it a good go. I'm sure we all have, but you know, not possible. The, the squish, the compression lasers are nanoseconds in length. So that's about the time for your computer to access its, its memory. And the pressures that we're achieving eventually are hundreds of gigabar. And that's basically similar to the pressures inside the sun, about 250 gigabar. So when I say we're building miniature stars on Earth, I'm not being totally disingenuous. I actually mean it. We're, we're creating the conditions inside the center of the sun, which is incredibly exciting. So what are we doing it with? Well, we're doing it with the biggest laser ever built, the National Ignition Facility that's in uh, the Bay Area of California. Um, so just on one side here, one side here, we've got um, a large target that kind of looks like the Death Star from Star Wars, where 192 beams of laser light come in and compress a tiny little pellet to very high densities. And... 
This on the other side kind of looks like a factory, but it's just some of the 192 beans that are in uh, the National Ignition Facility. And this is just an aerial view of it. So it's a big facility. It's me I've measured it in uh, uh, units of American football pitches. It's because it's in America. It's in the Bay Area of California at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. This is the most impressive and beautiful laser ever built. It's been operating for about a decade now, and it's getting some really, really exciting results out, um, which I'll tell you about. But when it's not operating as a, a laser, it features in movies in, in Hollywood. It was in Star Trek Into the Darkness. And actually, some of the staff got to be extras in that movie. So that the target chamber itself ended up being uh, like the core control room here uh, in Star Trek Into the Darkness. So, so it does pay off to work on these big facilities because eventually you end up uh, in Hollywood movies. But the latest result that's coming out of the NIF actually, I think, means that it's going to move from the stuff of Hollywood to maybe fusion being the stuff of reality. Because where we are now, this is the last thing that I'm going to talk to you about, is that it's taken 10 long, really difficult years at the National Ignition Facility, where at the beginning, they weren't getting the results they thought. They really didn't understand what, what, what was happening. 10 long years of careful, incremental and textbook beautiful science to a result that they got this year which is they they got 1.3 megajoules of energy out of these tiny little compressions that's not point so that's 70 percent of the laser energy that they put in so this is really impressive we're getting really really close to what we would call um well laser break even really um now of course Lasers are incredibly inefficient. The lasers we've got, so the NIF is a glass laser like I was talking about, like Vulcan. Um, so they're about 1% or less efficient. So we're not talking wall plug break even here, but they're almost getting towards getting as much energy out as you put in uh, from laser light. Um, so these are very, very exciting times. I Needless to say, I was bouncing up and down on my spring earlier this year. And in fact, just earlier, just before I started talking to you, we, we heard a talk from one of the key scientists at Livermore called Omar Hurricane, who has the, the coolest name in the world, um, telling us all about how they managed to get this result. And I just think it's so incredible. And so I want to end on that note saying that although it's a really hard journey and we've been working on it for a long time, we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. So on that note, thank you so much for listening. Fantastic, Kate. Really, really exciting stuff. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely have tried to eat a Kit Kat that quickly, but um, <laughs> I'm nowhere. I'm nowhere near as fast as a laser. I don't think. <laughs> um, we've got a, We've got about six minutes for some questions, mm -hmm. so we've got some fantastic questions which have come through. Um, so first, a couple of general questions about lasers. Mm -hmm. um, Irene has asked if coherent light doesn't diverge. Um, would that mean that then a light, a, if a laser shine into the sky, it would just keep on traveling all the way through space? Well, yeah. So, so there are things that actually act to, to kind of uh, degrade that, um, that sort of narrow non-divergence. So stuff in the sky, molecules, that stuff that gets in the way in the upper atmosphere. Um, so that acts to scatter light um, in much in the same way that light from the sun is scattered depending on the angle it's coming through. So sky looks blue at some point, you know, and then red at others, right? Um, rally scattering, right? So laser light would be scattered in our atmosphere. I reckon if you shone a laser from somewhere in space, it would definitely get further because we've got the interstellar medium, but it's much more tenuous than the upper atmosphere that we have on Earth. Mm -hmm. But in theory, it, it should get quite far. Um, uh, you know, if you shone a laser from Earth to the moon, for example, it would be Maybe, I don't know, I think it's tens or hundreds of metres by the time it gets there. But that's a pretty narrow, narrow divergence. Mm. Uh, but yeah. OK. And so that kind of relates to a question that Wilfie and Arthur have asked, is that would light go on forever if there was nothing in the way of it then? That's an interesting question, right? So um, it sort of does, right, if you think about it. Um, we're still seeing the glow of the Big Bang, Right. We, it, it, it shifts in wavelength as it kind of mm. loses energy, right? But so the Big Bang produced a huge like flash of light, 
what we see now is what we call cosmic microwave background. So it got to the point where it shifted to, to microwaves. So, so that was some 12 billion years ago, right? So um, it's still going. Eventually, it would probably run out of energy due to just kind of interactions with stuff in, in space. Obviously, if it was a perfect vacuum, you know, interesting, right? But uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing for sure. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so Christy Jonas has asked, um, do the atoms in a laser get larger when they're excited? Oh, that's a really good question. No, they don't tend to. Um, so if you think about what, what it actually means for an atom to be excited, is if we zoom into the atom, we've got the nucleus and we've got electrons kind of hanging around. Now, actually, it turns out those electrons quite like to hang around in little orbits. And when, when an atom is excited, actually what it means is some of the electrons have got absorbed some energy and managed to jump up into another orbit. And it's actually the electron. So it's not the atom itself. That's the sort of macro thing. It's actually the electron that gets excited. And then when it's de-excites, it has to emit light in order to do that. So, so the, the, the atom in and of itself doesn't really change size so much as the, the electrons are kind of doing their thing inside the atom when, when the atom becomes excited. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so then a couple of questions about things in your talk. Jason has asked, what is it that's causing the energy drop off in that, that graph you showed where it's the energy that we'll need versus the, it's, it's just because we're running out of fossil fuel. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's, it's kind of the, the, yeah, the, the sort of running out and the hard to get to nature of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Now I don't exactly know whether they have, because this, I think that plot was made a wee while ago. So I mm -hmm. don't think they've particularly made assumptions about, storage of renewables and things like that so obviously that's a really important thing obviously this is largely based on kind of you know best efforts you know in terms of capturing solar and everything else plus nuclear plus fossil fuels and how we can get to them obviously yeah. um you've got things like fracking and stuff which makes it sort of easier to get to some of the some of the sort of more deeply buried stuff in the ground but uh i would say that I would recommend we don't do that given where yeah. we are with, uh, yeah. <laughs> with trying to go to a carbon free energy source. So yeah. that's why fusion is very attractive. Now, I don't just to, as a caveat, I don't think it should be the only energy, energy generation mechanism. We need to diversify that. We need to have a, a patchwork of different energy generation mechanisms such that we're not dependent on one thing because it's very yeah. dangerous, as you know. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. So we've got a, to finish up, we've got a couple of more speculative questions. Yeah. Um, so someone has asked, could a laser cause an asteroid to change course if it was big enough? That's interesting. So I so, so the only way I could imagine you, oh, yeah, that's, hmm, probably not, I think in short, because I mean, High intensity lasers, right? They they get high intensity by focusing them really mm -hmm. a lot, right? But then you focus them to a very very small point. So what you probably end up doing is ablating a little bit of the asteroid. But would it, would that affect the course enough? I I absolutely don't know. Uh, that is the honest answer. It's yeah. not something that I think about on a daily basis. No. Now, if they're trying to bump spacecraft into asteroids aren't they? Because that's that yeah, arrow yeah. thing that got launched recently. So you probably don't need to go to the extent of uh, making a high power laser when you can just clunk a, <laughs> <laughs> clunk a, 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 a spacecraft into yeah. it. A slightly more um, Flintstones <laughs> approach to, yeah. um, to dealing with the solution. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and then maybe a couple more questions. Um, Isabella has asked, does nuclear fusion create more energy than nuclear fission? Not at the moment, unfortunately, um, but it will do when it's when it's ready. Um, at the moment, um, we've not managed to get energy gain, which is when all of the losses in the reactor are outweighed by the energy that you manage to produce. That's something that we're desperately working towards in many mm -hmm. different ways. There's many different ways of doing fusion. I just told you about one way. Um, but when but when it does uh, when it does happen, it does have the potential to unleash a huge amount of energy. Um, that sounds dangerous. It's not dangerous. It's we're doing it in a very controlled manner. Um, so yeah, it's very exciting times. Hmm. And then will there not be quite the same levels of waste? 
right. as, as with nuclear fission. Right. So what we're doing, so the byproducts, as you saw, was was uh, the helium nucleus and a, and a neutron. Now, mm. to say that fusion is totally clean is a lie um, because the neutron likes to go out into its surroundings and undergo nuclear reactions because that's how I said we were going to make tritium after all, right? So it has the power to activate things. So there will be some nuclear waste, but it's low level. It's not long lived. Whereas fission, I'm not anti-fission, by the way. I think it's a very, very important stepping stone for us uh, with the situation we have now, especially given we haven't done fusion. But fission takes big atoms and splits it into smaller atoms. So that's so that's kind of the opposite process to, to fusion. Um, it does produce long lived radioactive waste. So we have to think of good ways of managing it. Um, fusion is much better off in that sense. Um, but it's still not a free lunch. As soon as you start monkeying around with the atom, there's going to be some radioactivity somewhere along the line. So, yeah, brilliant. Well, I guess um, this is a, a fantastic area of science for the young people watching to go into in the next 10, 15, 20 years, there's going to be huge developments and even bigger, more powerful lasers to smash stuff up. So um, yeah. it definitely seems like this is an exciting, exciting area of science to be working in. Right. We, I mean, the landscape of fusion overall, including all the other methods, is so exciting right now, especially in the UK. And what we really need is young minds to come in and apply their, their knowledge. And it's, not, and it's really not focused at universities. It won't be in the future. It will be, you know, in sort of the commercial realm as well, eventually. So uh, good times, right? Really exciting times for all of us, actually. It's um, very optimistic. 